So he went there to Naioth in Ramah. Then the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naioth in Ramah. And he also stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. What are the circumstances around this event? Saul was trying to kill David out of anger. You wouldn't think that from reading this, would you? Now it happened as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward, and it happened on the next day, that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. So as you can see, Saul is trying to kill David. It's on his mind. But Jonathan convinces his dad Saul not to kill David. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his dad, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine. And Yehovah brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood, to kill David without cause? Jonathan was trying to help his dad. He could see that his dad was being led by anger and emotions had taken the reins of his dad's life. So he took him aside and used logic and reason to reason with his dad. He pretty much laid out in front of him the fruits of David's relationship and Saul's relationship with one another. I've got a list here for you of those pros and cons. It's like when a man or a woman has to choose between two likely candidates. Sometimes they'll sit down and they'll write down the pros and cons of each person so that they can make a logical decision. One of the pros is that David fought and killed the Philistine Goliath. David also captained many men in battles against the Philistines. When Saul was when Saul was under mental and spiritual anguish, David soothed him. There are a few cons here, and they're not really cons. They're just kind of the way it is. They are cons to Saul if he chooses not to humble himself. But in Saul's pride, he, we find that uh, people praise David more highly than Saul. God had given David an anointing to be king, and he had repeatedly told Saul that he was no longer king. Let's just say that Jonathan made sure to focus on the pros. So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, As the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Then Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him all these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. So as we can see, Jonathan convinced his dad not to kill David, reasoning with him and laying out the facts for him. It'd be wonderful if Saul would have stood in the truth and humbled himself and walked the path that Yahuwah had laid out before him. But because Saul would not walk that path, we find that Saul slips. And unfortunately, the nature of men is that 
if they are brought to grace, then slip from it, falling, without getting back up, the state of that man becomes worse than at the first. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be also with this wicked generation. Unfortunately for both Saul and David, Saul began trying to kill David again. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the group of prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as leader over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. So let me put that into perspective here. These men, their job was to go kill David. And when they came to Samuel, David being with Samuel, they didn't kill him. Instead, the Spirit of God came over them and they prophesied. And when Saul was told, he sent other messengers and they prophesied likewise. Then Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. Then he also went to Ramah and came to the great well that is at Sehu. So he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And someone said, Indeed, they are at Naioth and Ramah. So he went there to Naioth and Ramah. Then the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naioth and Ramah. And he also stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Therefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? Now, Saul in his worsened state even, in the midst of trying to kill the Lord's anointed, begins to prophesy. What magnificent lesson can we learn from this living, breathing, artistic display of how the Father has wedged human life as pawns between the kingdoms of light and darkness? Here are some examples of God displaying his grace, which is his power. One, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Further, the Bible itself is made available to all in its perfected form to guide us to unadulterated truth through the desire and hands of wicked men. King James. There are so many examples, but lastly and again, I say, we have the example of Balaam. Balaam, Balaam, Balaam. Here's a list of all the things that Balaam did. And it certainly looks like a list of things that you would find coming from a righteous person. God came to Balaam. God met with Balaam. God put a word in Balaam's mouth. God's spirit came upon Balaam. Hmm. Who else are we talking about right now where God's spirit came upon him? Balaam heard God's words and saw the vision of God. 
Balaam knew the knowledge of God. And Balaam prophesied of Israel and the coming Messiah accurately. Yet, we know Balaam is wicked. This leads us to the point. Both frightening and awesome. But if received into a vessel, righteous. Will drive them closer into intimate, beautiful fellowship with God's Ruach HaKodesh, His Holy Spirit. Saul, prophesying with Samuel, was not a sign that Saul was righteous or in good standing with God. Instead, his fruits showed his wickedness, which he was desperate and hopeless against, a true victim. But it is God's awesome power that came over him and used him in the depths of him serving his wicked desires even. To speak prophetic words. How can such a thing be? What massages our Father to perform such a thing for people here on earth? Faith, which is obedience. The Father saw David keeping his commands faithfully and loved him. It was David's righteousness, his obedience to God's spirit in him, that gave God an opportunity to be magnified, lauded, and glorified in this circumstance that we are honored to be able to read about and learn from today. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. And this brings us to the very crux of the video, the point, the green of the grass, the fresh of the air, the foundation of the building, the warmth of the sun, the fragrance of the flowers, basically what I'm saying. Don't let God displaying his grace cause you to be fooled into thinking that somebody is righteous when they're not. If somebody prophesying in his name, casting out demons in his name, and doing wonders in his name are not signs of righteousness, then what are? If God coming to somebody, God meeting with somebody, God putting a word in someone's mouth, God's very spirit coming upon them, having somebody hear God's words and seeing his very vision, somebody knowing the knowledge of God, somebody prophesying accurately. If those aren't a characteristic of God's fruit, then what are? I've got it. They can't just be prophesying. They must be prophesying naked. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that those things are bad. Those things are good. They are God's grace. God tells us that we will know them by their fruits. And their fruits should follow the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. Now the fruit of the Spirit is all of these things working together, lacking none. Self-control. Self-control is a big one. But if self-control lacks love, joy, and peace, it's not it. It's not it. Faithfulness is huge. 
But corporate America, you can't move your way up the ladder unless you display faithfulness. If faithfulness lacks gentleness, joy, long-suffering, and goodness, it's not it, fam. It's not the real deal. If love, peace, kindness, and faithfulness are all working together with long-suffering, but they lack self-control, it ain't it. It ain't the green of the grass. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. They all must be working together, lacking nothing. Now, if you've got those characteristics and those other things, God coming to a person, God speaking through a person, God doing miraculous wonders through a person, if all of those things are working together, then that's a righteous person. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What does it mean against such there is no law? Does it mean that those things do whatever they want? Absolutely not. It means that those things are innocent. You cannot convict the fruit of the Spirit because it is innocent. By God's law, it's innocent. And those who are Messiahs have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. These things all cannot be working together if the flesh has not been crucified. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. That's simply saying faith. Faith is more than believing. If you're going to live in the Spirit, you must do the things of the Spirit, or you are not living in the Spirit. And this is all followed up with a warning. It doesn't seem like a warning that we need to watch out for, but it certainly is. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Most of you listening, you can say, I'm not going to, I don't become conceited. I don't provoke others. I don't envy others. You know, you probably don't consciously mean to. But you are most likely not fully whole yet. And as such, these things are nestled deep inside the dark labyrinth of the heart. And it's not like you're consciously doing these things, but when certain circumstances arise and certain buttons are pushed, and certain circumstances are threatened against you, these things do come out. Especially when you're around somebody who has all of these things and is lacking none. Don't become envious. Don't provoke. Don't become conceited. He tells us that we will know them by their fruits. So these are the good fruits. This here, all all of these things are all pointing to the Father via action. So what is pointing away from the Father? So if you find somebody who is doing wonderful, awesome things, all the things that Balaam was doing that seemed so good, Casting out demons, prophesying, doing wondrous works. However, any of these things are found in that person, then they are described to the Lord as lawless and ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. Do you see greed, envy, murder? Come on now, most of us aren't murdering. Don't say because I don't murder, this doesn't apply to me. Do you ever feel greed? Do you feel like it's okay to feel greed? That's not God. That's not the Spirit. 
He wants to work with you to get through that. And yes, being crucified sucks. But whatever greed is in you now is not welcome in the kingdom. You have to start working on it now. Are you so busy buying and selling and marrying and living your life that you will not focus on working through your greed? That's not the spirit. Is there strife in your life, deceit? Do you know somebody who they don't want to be known, so instead of trusting in the cloud and in God's ways, they purposefully, intentionally try to deceive others. What about malice or gossip? When you're in a bad place, do you try to deflect responsibility through gossip? How about slander? When somebody does something evil to you, or somebody threatens your family, or somebody is behaving in a way that is downright threatening and wrong and has caused you to believe that you can't have anything to do with that person. Do you come to that person and speak with them about it? Or do you go running around warning everybody of how evil this person is? Do you slander people's characters? Whether it's accurate or not, are you running around being the judge and the persecutor? Condemning a person's relationships without even allowing them to be in the courtroom. Are you slandering people's character? Are you insolent? Are you arrogant? Do you go through a cycle of being boastful, followed by strife and deceit, working through it and doing something that lifts up your courage and causes you to be boastful again, only to send you back into that cycle? Are you disobedient to the authority of your Father? If these things are found in somebody who is doing miracles and all of those other things, be careful. They are a wolf in sheep's clothing. Whether they're aware of it or not, doesn't matter. People will come to the Father. Lord, I was prophesying in your name. I was doing miracles. Father, I cast out demons in your name. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's lawlessness that causes people to continue in greed, slander, gossip, arrogance, strife, and deceit. The rest of this I added myself. Against such there is law. You are guilty. They are guilty. And it's not okay. God's desire is to fix you. It's not his fault that you won't be fixed. It's your fault. It's their fault. Against such there is law. Brothers and sisters, take courage. Take a step in faith and let the Lord crucify your flesh. Do not be afraid. Take faith. He desires, the creator of the universe, desires to love you as his child. He has died for you, but he can't do it for you. He died for you. Take hold of your inheritance. We don't serve a lawless God. Our Father has a law. It is written and it is plain as day. Those who are innocent are innocent and those who are guilty are guilty. He died for your sins. Have you taken hold of that? If you have, are you trampling on the blood of God? 
His desire is to fix you. Stop living your life. Crucify the flesh. And those who are not messiahs have not crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If you will, my friends, meditate on these things for a time. It will be nourishment to the good tree growing inside of you. And the fruit that comes from that tree is pleasing to Adonai, Yeshua Messiah.